you can see everybody coming in so you're all welcome and uh, we'll be starting in a while once everybody has been able to join. So we're still having people joining us. So as you're joining, just to say we'll be starting in a minute uh, once everybody's had an opportunity to join. So welcome everybody, it's good to see already, seeing colleagues from Ghana and Macedonia, the UK, India, um, all over the world, Zimbabwe, um, Philippi Philippines, so great to see everybody. So good morning, afternoon or evening, and welcome to this week's webinar, which is on palliative care and COVID-19, palliative care for older people in the context of COVID-19. This webinar is being recorded and will be available shortly after completion. So my name is uh, Professor Julia Downing. I'm the Chief Executive of the International Children's Palliative Care Network and I'll be moderating this session today. This webinar is part of a series on a project on palliative care and COVID-19, which has been developed jointly by the International Association for Hospice and Palliative Care, the International Children's Palliative Care Network, Palliative Care in Humanitarian Aid Situations and Emergencies and the Worldwide Hospice Palliative Care Alliance. So the objective of this series is to provide globally relevant information and guidance to civil society, UN organisations, policy makers, administrators, healthcare providers on palliative care in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. The webinars are accompanied by briefing notes written by experts from around the world and the briefing notes are available in the globalpalliativecare.org website. And the web webinars are also uploaded there and on each of our organisational websites as well. And we are very grateful to the contributors of the series and for today's presenters for accepting our invitation to participate in this collaborative project. Now you might be wondering why the Chief Executive of the Children's Network is moderating a session on older people. Partly because I offered to and um, because I know um, Professor Sheila Payne well and Sheila coordinated the development of the briefing note. But also I think one of the things about this pandemic is that many of us are doing things that we, we would not have done in the past. I have spoken to several of my paediatric colleagues who have been redeployed to work in the adult setting. Many of us are also working in areas of care such as the intensive care unit where we haven't previously worked. So many of the previous norms have gone and some of the edges have become blurred. For myself, I work with children's palliative care, but I've been helping out clinically during the pandemic and just this weekend was caring for some older people with palliative care needs, some of whom had COVID-19. So for me, definitely the edges have become blurred. So I'm really interested to hear what our colleagues have to say to us today. So the webinar will feature three 15 minute presentations with time at the end for question and answers. We'll also have a reflection from Stephen Watiti and we're privileged to have with us Dr. Claudia Marla, who is the independent expert on the rights of older people for the UN Human Rights Council. And she will also be sharing with us. Following that, we will have the opportunity for questions to the panelists. So please type your questions into the chat box and please type them to everyone and not just the panelists so that everybody can see the questions that are being asked. And Shelley and Kate from WHPCA will be looking at the questions and reading them out to our panelists. So next slide, please, Stephen. 
So within our briefing notes, we have developed the briefing note on palliative care for older persons infected with COVID-19. Such an important area as we know that older persons are bearing the brunt of the global pandemic. And we'd like to thank all of our experts from around the world who have been involved in developing this briefing note. So now over to our first speaker. Next slide, please. Our first speaker is Professor Sheila Payne, who is Emeritus Professor at the International Observatory on End of Life Care at Lancaster University in the UK. She does a lot of work with regards to palliative care with older people, and we are delighted that she's here with us today. So Sheila will be speaking about the current situation for older people in the context of COVID-19. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, Julia, for your kind words. And I'm going to ask Stephen to go to the next slide. So older people have really taken the brunt of uh, the COVID-19 crisis in most countries around the world. In Europe, for example, we are now being told that around about 50% of all deaths are of, uh, in COVID have been in care homes for older people, nursing homes or long-term care facilities. In Canada, it's apparently even higher at around about 80%. So there are some major concerns that we need to be aware of, and it is a global concern. So in my talk, I'm going to start by talking about older people and thinking about what we mean when we talk about older people, access to palliative care for older people, and then particularly focusing on factors um, about the vulnerability of older people to COVID-19, the personal factors, social environmental factors, and the recommendations I'll finish up with but hopefully we will, this will also provide an introduction and a foundation for the subsequent talks that we're going to hear today. So next, please. I've taken this slide um, from some UN guidance on COVID-19 and older persons. And oh, we seem to be going back in the slides. That's, that's fine, thank you. Um, and this just very summari uh, neatly summarises some of the key issues. Now, I won't have time to cover them all today, but we need to be aware of an economic impact, the mental health of people who are asked to isolate, that older people themselves are responding and contributing to helping people, other people who have COVID-19. I've already highlighted issues about mortality, and I will say a little bit more about that. And the vulnerability that older people face. So for some older people, they're subject to abuse and neglect. And I know that that will be an issue that some of my colleagues later will be presenting about. So next, please. I'm going to start by thinking about a definition of older people. And I speak as an older person myself. So chronological definitions tend to vary by country and by socioeconomic circumstances. So in some parts of the world, for particularly disadvantaged people, you can be regarded as old from about 50 years onwards. The UN, tends to accept the definition of 60 plus, and in other countries it's 65. But what I want to stress is that we need to take account of functional and cognitive ability as well, and also how older people themselves perceive older age. And we tend to uh, look at them as recipients of care or label them as vulnerable. But I just want to highlight a particularly impressive person in, in the United Kim, Kingdom called Captain Tom, who's 90, uh, who's just celebrated his 100th birthday. And he's uh, a Second World War veteran. He has raised over 33 million pounds for NHS charities. So he most definitely is not a victim. 
he's a major source of inspiration. And I think we, we often have good examples like that from other countries. So next, please. This is just a reminder of the global life expectancy. So this is figures from 2017. The dark blue areas indicate where life expectancy is greater than 80 years. And very sadly, there are countries which are in black where you can expect a life expectancy of less than 40 years. So there are stark differences um, around the world. Next, please. These are data from um, the UN showing the distribution of age and gender on confirmed COVID-19 cases. Um, and uh, these data were from mid-April, so um, some time ago now. But they do demonstrate the impact that um, uh, on, on older people of having COVID-19 is predominantly um, present in older people. And certainly that's reflected in mortality rates, death rates too. Next, please. So what are the risk factors for vulnerability of older people? And I'm going to start with personal characteristics. Data suggests that overwhelmingly it is affecting men uh, more than women and men are equally more likely to die. And in some countries that's around about 70% uh, compared to women. It's also particularly difficult for people with underlying health conditions that affect cardiovascular, respiratory or immune systems. And we have to recall that older people over 65 typically would have at least one or more of uh, what are called comorbid conditions. And that affects the mortality, particularly of the over 80 years. Obesity is known to be a major risk factor. And in some countries, black and ethnic minority groups called race in some countries, um, also seem to have a, a higher incidence of both getting the disease and dying from the disease. And we're not quite sure why, maybe uh, linked to deprivation or some of the other characteristics already there. Next, please. These are factors influencing vulnerability of older people from social and environmental reasons. In uh, most countries, older women are more likely to experience poverty and poverty and deprivation are linked to higher incidence of getting COVID-19. Older women are also heavily involved in most countries in providing informal care, usually to an older spouse, but maybe to other members of their household. And Nazim is going to tell us more about um, how older people affected by humanitarian uh, emergencies and difficult living conditions are impacted. I've highlighted already that older persons living in nursing homes, especially with dementia, are at increased risk. Next, please. So let's move on to think about what palliative care can offer older people with COVID-19. So as acknowledged in The Lancet, palliative care is an essential clinical component of COVID-19 care. And in many countries, we've really emphasized intensive care beds, the availability of ventilators. And while those are important, equally important is the provision of good quality palliative care. We also know from the Lancet Commission data that older people are less likely in normal circumstances to receive palliative care. And I've just tried to define here what I mean by palliative care, particularly for frail older people. So it is an active approach, it's not doing nothing. And it's suitable for older people living with and dying from any health related condition that is life threatening. And it focuses on physical, psychological, social, 
existential and cultural aspects and it includes their families and office bereavement support. Next, please. So the current situation is that mo many older people remain at home in quarantine. And for many women, that means living alone, but equally difficult for older men. And the reduction in people availability of either families, neighbors or social care services to enable older people to remain at home is causing a major problem. So these uh, older people may well be suffering in terms of their mental health and general well-being. And it particularly highlights the importance of nursing home residents, where there is a very high mortality and many of them feel also very isolated from their family. In some countries and in some in, uh, sectors, there are ageist assumptions about what older people need or don't need, and that may influence triage decisions and not allow a, older people to receive, for example, acute care, even if their medical needs warrant it. Next, please. So there are a number of recommendations that I've highlighted here and they are published in the briefing notes. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through each of them. But we feel that it's really important that older people's palliative care needs are assessed along with their um, other condition and other medical needs in relation to COVID policies, and all healthcare settings. The people across the board, but particularly in low and middle income countries have sufficient financial resources because for many, they don't have pensions to rely on. In the nursing home context, we've shown from the PACE study, which is palliative care for older people in care homes, it's a large European study that you can introduce good quality palliative care and that nursing staff are in care homes are able to deliver it. There needs to be a balance within the care home between protecting people but also enabling family connection either through teleconferencing or other mechanisms so that people feel integrated as well. So advanced care planning may be a useful thing to think about, but not force on older people. Palliative care also offers particularly important skills in relation to communication and support for families when patients need to be admitted to critical and intensive care environments. And for all people, we should be concerned to ensure that they have adequate um, infection control when they're delivering care but we need to think about ensuring psychosocial and spiritual support to staff working in hospitals nursing homes and many other settings next please i think it's essential that we provide basic education in care homes but also to hospital staff so that they know how to communicate well even when they're wearing uh, protective equipment and people can't see their faces well, and that we support families and offer bereavement care, and that staff have opportunities to debrief after deaths. And in intensive care units, that's a very large number of proportion of people who die. Next, please. We need to also ensure that we evaluate our policies and practices in the future and that we include the views of older people and their families in that process. Next, please. So thank you very much for listening and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Sheila, for your presentation. And just a reminder to everyone that we will be taking questions at the end. So please type your questions in the chat box to um, all panellists and people attending. So I'd now like to move on to our next speaker and I'd like to welcome Professor Nezim Ahmed 
from the Department of Palliative Medicine at Bangarandu Sheikh Mujahid Medical University in Bangladesh. And we are delighted to have uh, you with us, Professor Nazam, and uh, I'd like to invite you to come and speak to us on the social impact of COVID-19 on older persons in lower income countries. Thank you. Thank you, Julia, uh, and thank you, Sheila. I've been listening to what you're saying. Very, very elaborative and interesting architecture. Thank you. And thank you for asking me to talk about social impact of COVID-19 on older persons in lower income countries. Uh, I understand that the reason we are having this webinar is in the first place, is the global outbreak of the COVID-19 and its impact particularly focusing on elderly. Now, it's understandable that whatever we discuss today is only will be the tip of the iceberg in the world of policy making and strategy to tackle the challenge of this disease. But nevertheless, the pandemic is global. The pooling of effort needs global solidarity, but the impact is deeply local. And we all must understand the different social dynamics prevailing amongst the different countries, as well as amongst the different social stratification within the same country. Uh, Stephen, next slide, please. And so to expect a practical social justice in the COVID-19 global response, understanding the social dynamics of individuals, a country is very important. So may I take uh, the permission from here on to request to all to leave aside all presumption and start with a fresh outlook to explore the existing realities. Because uh, when I'm sitting here in Bangladesh, uh, see the media, international media and the local media talking about realities of COVID-19 affecting, I, I hear always social distancing, hand wash, diagnostic tests, vaccines, intensive care units, management protocol. Uh, but what is the reality of lower and middle income countries where I was calculating today that out of the 750 million elderly people globally, 350 almost people live in certain Asian, South Asian, Asian and Sub-Saharan region where the situation is probably entirely different from many other parts of the world uh, where there's provision of social distancing is just a luxury very, very weak and fragile primary health care, very limited access to basic resources and very unequal distribution of facilities. Now with that, if we want to see the social impact, next slide please, Stephen. Uh, now this social impact is such a broad term that we probably have to be a bit careful of not trying to delve into the uh, in details of this, this uh, but taking a few factors like economic, physical, mental health, which also varies uh, from place to place, from country to country very much. Now, for example, Taking Bangladesh as a, case, as a case scenario for all other lower and middle income countries where I believe a lot of, even a uh, lot of similarities between different countries. I would like to, can you come to the next slide? During the next few minutes, uh, I will try to see how COVID has created a social impact differently amongst different elderly group considering this picture. Now, quite often when we delve into the layers of social impact of COVID-19, we have a tendency to take into consideration as even the lower 
income countries as a very homogeneous strata. But unfortunately, it is not like that. Even in lower income countries, three or four groups, for example, in lower income countries, there's one group who are upper and middle, upper middle income urban group, probably a privileged group, not more than 15, 20% in the whole country. But when you come to the other majority of the population, they belong to the lower and lower middle class and the poor, and some are very ultra poor. Now, and most of them live in the rural part. And the socioeconomic structure is such that the elderly population is, do not have any financial existence separately, mostly dependent on earning members of the household, mostly economically inactive, and the large percentage of the women elderly people are actually widowed. Almost uh, two thirds of them uh, do not have any uh, education level. And uh, these, these we, we, if we talk about global elderly, then we cannot leave these people behind. Next slide, please. And this 7.7% of the total of the total elderly, a very large population is living in, in say slum areas, is living in the refugee camps, and also living in the ultra poor uh, section of the, of the society. Now, considering the slum, say, for example, that 55% of the population, urban population, is living in Bangladesh in more than 9,000 slums. Uh, now, the reason I'm stressing on the lower and lower middle income, rural and suburb dwelling, because, the, because not only they form the majority, but they're more prone to the risk of COVID, and also more people will now move into this stratum due to the economic impact of COVID-19. We must remember, as we were discussing previously, that the elderly of the country are in most cases not a separate entity, but reliant on the decision of the household. Thus the impact that reach them are often more severe as they pass through the household dynamics. It's just a trickle down effect from the upper, from the upper stratum of the household to reach them. Uh, so today's most widely circulated newspaper quotes in Bangladesh, that 23% population has very recently gone down below the poverty line due to the economic crisis in the last one and a half month. And this tendency is more prominent amongst the urban 25% population than, only, than in rural 21% of the rural population. This ultimately means that 43% people in this country now live Nazan, you've gone on to mute for some reason. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Thank you. Yeah, next slide, please, Stephen. Now, with such a condition, if we look at the health system, the health system is very fragile. Uh, can I see the, I can't see my slides actually. Um, just give me a moment. Okay. Uh, Stephen, can you show the slide, please? It's, uh, it's uh, showing. Um, it's I think it's showing. All right. oh, I can't see it anyway. So the, the health system, the general health system in, in here, the primary healthcare is so labile and so fragile that it has almost collapsed. And uh, 
Now, with this fragile health system, now if we, we have still been talking about ICU facilities, the which type of mask we should be wearing, which type of personal protection equipment we should be using when there are doctors dying, nurses being affected with COVID-19 as the frontline worker. Now, with these background, when if we, if, we, if we consider the policy, what should be the policies, uh, we also should take into the, the culture of the, these countries. When thinking of the Eastern and African countries and their cultures, we often have imagined that we have a strong and extensive family ties, which is true to some extent, but this is and this is all also breaking down as more people migrate to cities in search of work and urbanizations. So at the end of the day, in one hand, we don't have proper healthcare system, not only proper, even the basic healthcare system to confront the effect of COVID-19. On the other hand, the social, social situation is uh, going down very rapidly. So thinking about facing the challenge only from the medical perspective will probably be something uh, impractical. Uh, so next slide, please. Stephen, next slide, please. Now, I'm showing you this picture taken only three or four days ago. Now, and I've titled it that, can we really blame these people? What about the issue of social distancing, personal hygiene, et cetera, in this COVID pandemic where in Bangladesh, this is now in the second, third stage. That means with totally community, community transmission has taken place. And in this, this is the people who are going home in this scenario where everything, every, everyone is supposed to be locked down in the country, but now they're going back to their village home. And uh, you see the police is wearing, a, one of the policemen is wearing a, if you call it a personal protective equipment, it is that. So now that we have explored only the tip of the iceberg of the situation in this low, middle and in, lower income countries. If you, if you say that we have to make a policy to address the COVID-19 challenge, then uh, I think we have to be very cautious, not only dealing with the medical issues, but also dealing with the other social and cultural issues together. Thank you very much. Next slide. Uh, these few recommendations, as a clinician, all we could think about a few recommendations is that the elderly people in this part of the world should be treated as a respected group of people with a special attention uh, from particularly from the social point of view and uh, then from the medical point of view. And these four recommendations we could see for immediate near future, but a broader aspect of uh, exploration will be needed to really for these group of people in these countries. Thank you very much. Thank Next. you. Thank you yeah. very much, Nizam. And really important, you've highlighted so many important issues for us when we're thinking about um, older people in the context of COVID-19. And now we're going to move from Bangladesh, but to a country that we know has been impacted hard by COVID-19 to um, Italy. And uh, so I would like to invite our next speaker, who is Dr. Simone Senesi from Italy. He's a general practitioner, a palliative care and geriatric medicine expert. And we are delighted that he's able to join us and to share some of his experience from Italy. Uh, so you're welcome, Dr. Simone. 
Thank you to all. Um, uh, please, the next slide. Um, well, I'm working, uh, I'm living in the north of Italy. My region is Emilia Romagna, is one of the most uh, uh, targeted by SARS CoV virus. Uh, the number that uh, is shown in the slide uh, comes from government, mm, but probably uh, is not complete data because the, the number could be three times higher. And uh, um, the main problem was uh, at the beginning uh, the lack of uh, protective, uh, uh, personal protective equipment, but not also, we don't have that, but uh, um, a nursing home staff doesn't know exactly how to use uh, PPE um, um, in the right way. Uh, nursing home in Italy, but I think in uh, all uh, Europe, uh, um, suffering from lack of resources and also from lack of staff, especially during this pandemic, uh, um, uh, physicians become sick, nurses become sick, and we don't have staff uh, enough staff to replace uh, people who uh, become sick, and we. Um, uh, working in this pandemic uh, with really low uh, resources, not only economical, but human resources. And behind this data is important, what about palliative care in this uh, uh, scenario? Please, Stephen, the next. next. And uh, I try to uh, identify three um, main uh, problems. The first one is we don't have uh, until today, clear data. We don't know how many people die in nursing home exactly because uh, at the beginning it was difficult to have the diagnosis. We don't know how many people die in hospital or in home care. And we, if we don't have uh, clear data, it's difficult to understand the phenomenon. Is, yes, we know we have high rate of people died in nursing home uh, suffering by COVID, but uh, it's also important how did the patient died and how to um, define strategy to improve palliative care for older people. Uh, I mentioned that, uh, uh, for example, in my area we have uh, um, a guideline and a project to uh, visit regularly nursing home before COVID. But uh, we have many local differences between the same country, but be, be, uh, between the same region, the same province. We don't have a um, homogeneous uh, system. Um, also, we don't have uh, a best practice model um, that can be um, helpful to identify uh, best strategy. Uh, next, please. I think uh, one answer uh, in Italy, but also in low or middle income country, could be primary palliative care because we don't have enough specialists and during a humanitarian crisis, specialists go to hospital or in any way they are overloaded. And if we don't have primary palliative care, we can't afford these palliative care needs among uh, this uh, uh, population. Uh, I think the result of PACE uh, projects are very important. Uh, we have to divulge uh, this much as possible, but I'm strongly uh, convinced that uh, our primary palliative care team uh, that can come uh, in nursing home regularly or uh, um, discuss uh, cases about home care setting could be uh, good, uh, one of the possible solution um, for this uh, problem. Uh, next one, please. Well, 
we know that uh, COVID-19 affect the health of older persons, but also affect uh, um, the right of human pers of uh, um, older persons because palliative care is human right, and we have to start from that. Uh, but also, people uh, need. Uh, um, um, to need uh, good health, uh, um, good health, mental health. These people are at risk of digital exclusion because uh, for some older people, uh, video call or social media can be something good, but from, for um, frailty people with uh, severe cognitive impairment, maybe this could be a kind of exclusion. They are a risk of violence and abuse. And also we have special challenge, uh, especially for people living alone, living in nursing homes, and special vulnerable uh, subgroup like LGBT, Roma people, refugees, prisoners, and we have to be in mind also them. And primary care could be a solution or an option at least for this kind of vulnerable population. Problem is COVID, but also problem is uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, the problem created by uh, isolation uh, measurement measure because uh, nursing, home, nursing home become infective disease unit with low social interaction, increased risk of delirium, risk of falls, low rehabilitation, increase of behavioral disorders, less access to, uh, access to GP um, and specialist visits. Some of them, like uh, uh, Sheila uh, said before, are victims of ageism prejudice. They are victims of loneliness. And also, we have to take in mind the uh, burnout of the caregiver and healthcare staff. Please, next. One of the problem is also that some older people doesn't have only red flags uh, symptoms, not only cold, fever, or dyspnea, but they uh, sometimes have a typical presentation like delirium, pole, uh, anorexia, chest pain, gastroenteritis symptoms, um, uh, unexplained hypoxia, and this is make the management very difficult because we have to isolate every people who have some red flags, but also the other that can be a typical COVID, uh, isolate waiting uh, <coughs> uh, laboratory test, and we <coughs> sorry don't have enough place uh, for isolate uh, these uh, uh, people because uh, uh, the infrastructure uh, are, is not uh, uh, always uh, uh, good also in uh, um, uh, Europe. Uh, next slide, please. And what did SARS-CoV-2 uh, find behind frailty? Um, I'm talking today uh, as a general practitioner, palliative care, uh, pr primary palliative care physician. And what we can uh, see uh, is this. Palliative care is often, often confused with end-of-life care. And this uh, um, is a huge problem because we're just thinking uh, to provide care at the end of life, but we have to Thinking of, um, about palliative care in advance is very difficult for non-palliative care uh, physician identify the um, uh, identify the patient who uh, could be benefited by palliative care. They don't know uh, the tools that can be used. We know there isn't one tool for uh, everything, but if we know uh the instrument uh, maybe we can do better in according to a caregiver and the team decision also uh, many physicians are uh, focused on urgency and they don't think uh, uh, about anticipatory care plan or anticipatory anticipatory uh, medication also we have lack of policy uh, in in uh, nursing home 
And what we can do uh, for that, strengthen primary care, uh, primary palliative care, renovate a palliative care education program, target on this topic, because I think they are, they are very important. We have to do more advocacy action for primary palliative care. And also it's very important to have something uh, like a key information summary, like Scotland, the UK, um, some medical recording where uh, decision about uh, end of life, uh, uh, resuscitation, are <coughs> right in uh, electronic recording and can be accessible for um, other settings. I think uh, it, this could be a space for a telemedicine project. Uh, next one, please. Uh, I try to write a little decalogue based on my experience in nursing home, and I think that every nursing home must have a palliative care procedure or guideline, because if we have guideline, we have a project. If we have a project, we have a team. If we have a project and team, we can uh, look uh, what happened in nursing home. Also regarding the use of uh, PPE. Uh, we need uh, of palliative care dedicated to each nursing home that can must visit nursing home regularly or active call the nursing home because problem is identification. But if we don't uh, identify patient who need palliative care, we can't do anything because the, the process <coughs> doesn't start. Palliative care team must be available 24 hours for seven days or at least 12 hours, depend on resources. We have to uh, working uh, uh, to uh, nursing home staff uh, um, in the direction of anticipatory care plan. Um, it's really important uh, uh, that the palliative care medication uh, are available in nursing home, in home care, in each country, in uh, Europe, like in Africa, Asia, or everywhere, because if we don't have medication, we can do anything. Problem is COVID, but also problem is the post-COVID uh, situation. We have to guarantee psychological, uh, spiritual, and grief support. And this is very challenging uh, without face-to-face -face, uh, uh, contact, regular communication with family and com with compassionate approach, and also collaboration with other infection disease unit, geriatrics unit, local health authorities. Next one, please. Um, local guidelines is very important. We have to work that every place has some like this. This is <coughs> important for PPE crisis, but also, but also can be useful because we can create a symptom control for the um, We can create a kind of a, a list, contact list of specialists can uh, be support nursing home doctor, how to make a good assessment, uh, which kind of instrument uh, we can use for uh, do this. And also uh, it's really important to have a work team that can take care of the whole project. Next one, please. Uh, I try to make very simple the uh, decision making process, but it's very complicated. Uh, I leave extra slide for people who want to go deep on this. But basically, it's based on health uh, indicators, clinical, functional, and cognitive status, on prognosis and practical expected benefits of intensive intervention uh, versus. Uh, um, palliative care and uh, uh, care in uh, home care or nursing home care. Uh, we use uh, this tool, clinical variety scale, not alone, but combined with other uh, cognitive uh, test, uh, functional test to have a, a score. If patient have, um, has a score less than five, is likely to receive a benefit from intensive uh, treatment. If the score is higher than five, is expected that we not receive benefit 
from intensive care treatment. Of course, uh, is something, it seems simple, but it isn't simple. You have to discuss with caregiver, you have to discuss with patient if, if it's possible, and you have to discuss with the team to take the best decision uh, possible. <clears throat> Next one. Thanks. This is uh, our checklist to, um, is a kind of instrument with some demographic data uh, ongoing problems like medication, comorbidity, autonomy, cognitive status, the clinical freight scale, if we have advanced directive, uh, if uh, these directive, uh, directives uh, are shared uh, with the family, uh, decision about critical care, hospital care, palliative care, in this way it would be better to, in case of crisis, uh, to um, take the decision. Next one, please. Dr. Simon, you have two minutes left. Yeah. Uh, when we identify uh, the patient, it's really important that we have uh, PR and medication for each kind of symptoms. This is the reason because uh, vademecum for nursing home is really important. It can make the work a little bit easy. Next one, please. Uh, this is the, the reason because primary care involvement can be lead to on-site education, can produce a team that can go regular in nursing home, and also we don't have to uh, forget that doctor and nurses are in the community and we have a huge workload, but we have to come outside our workplace and go to the community and uh, try to involve uh, the community uh, in, uh, in this process. Next one, please. COVID is a problem, but post-COVID is a problem too. Uh, what we can do for, over, for older person after COVID, if, if COVID uh, finished, uh, what we can do for caregiver, what we can do for the distress of physician and their care staff, what about burnout, are uh, are we ready for other pandemic flares? We, this is an open question. The last one, please. Thank you. And my take home message is support primary palliative care and thinking to vulnerable uh, patients. And thanks uh, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Simone. Um, it's really good to hear from your experience from Italy. And uh, it's interesting because we have um, very different situations. Some countries we have nursing homes, but nursing homes have been hit hard by COVID. In other countries we don't have that, um, but the situation is such that the elderly population still have been hit hard um, by COVID. So I'd now like to ask uh, Dr. Stephen Watiti from Uganda just to share a few words um, on his reflections. Uh, Stephen is uh, HIV a HIV doctor, he's a palliative care advocate, and uh, he's had lived experience of leading palliative care. So we'd value a few words from you, Stephen. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Julia. I introduced myself, I'm Stephen Watita, as you've said, but um, by all definitions, I'm an older person because last week I turned 67 and uh, I currently live with my mother-in-law who is 91. And my mother also lives near, he's 90, so I have experience in that area, but um, as in, in Uganda, we don't have um, large numbers of people with uh, the COVID-19, about 260 or something uh, positive. However, the effects, of course, of the lockdown, which has been uh, especially on my own for living with HIV and older person living with HIV is that many of them cannot access their medication because many have to walk to seek medication. But what's still, even those who have medication, the issue of uh, food insecurity, because people can't work, most people, especially in the urban and the urban areas. So we are having a bit of problem there. And the older people tend to get the worst of, of the problem, because if it is food distribution, they are the one who gets it last. When it comes to stigma associated with HIV, they are the ones who get the brunt of it, who bear the brunt of it. So I think the, uh, 
the COVID, the effects of COVID-19 in Uganda, especially on people living in HIV, are going to be quite uh, devastating because there's going to be is poor adherence currently, um, mainly because of uh, poor access to services, but also uh, poor access to food, which makes it difficult for people to solve their medication. Unfortunately, the most of the people who have been helping are the younger people because they are the ones who have access to uh, technologies like uh, what we are using now. The older persons don't even have phones. You don't hear of them, although you stumble on them when you do. I have stumbled on a few who you realize many of them have given up depression and the older people who have uh, underlying conditions like cancer can't go for care. Some can't even have access to Morphine, with, which is fairly available in some places in Uganda, but now you cannot even go to pick it. So that is the problem we are having. I think the, we haven't got many patients of COVID-19 in Uganda. Well, possibly because we haven't tested much, but also because most of those who test are those who are coming from out and the truck drivers. But the effect of the lockdown is really devastating to the uh, population, but the older people, as it were, are getting the brunt of this. Those are the few uh, remarks I can say. We could have prepared better, maybe, maybe when these um, epidemics, of course, keep coming and you cannot predict when they come. But when they find a system like ours here, which is uh, limping as, as it were, the effects on the general population are devastating, but worse still on older people, because an older people living with HIV uh, in, in, that, in that case. Those are the few remarks I would like to say. Thank you very much, Stephen. That's so important that even though um, in Uganda, Hello. being able to keep the numbers down, team. the impact on, um, on, on older persons still has been great because of the lockdown and uh, unable to get access to um, medical care, et cetera. So then finally, before our questions and um, discussion, I'd like to um, invite Dr. Claudia Mahler to talk to us a bit about her role um, as an independent expert on the rights of older persons with the UN Human Rights Council and how it's relevant to our discussions today and how it links in with our discussions around of the older person and COVID-19. So thank you very much for joining us and over to you, Claudia. Thank you so much. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me and also the panelists for the excellent presentation. Thank you so much. I'm glad that we can update also the engagement with the mandate on the independent expert on the enjoyment of all human rights by older persons with also all your uh, umbrella organizations on palliative care. It is crucial for me to hear what older persons are facing in need of palliative care. Many examples through the COVID-19 pandemic showed once again that palliative care is not accessible, available or affordable for older persons around the globe. We also had to learn on a very drastic way that when it comes to the, that there are not enough resources for intensive care, for example, or medical treatment, there are still decisions based only on age, who will receive the treatment to get the life-saving treatment for older persons. And this is really an ageist approach and also a discriminatory approach. We, I, we also have to keep in mind, and it was already mentioned in the first presentation by Sheila, that, that the heterogeneity of the age group it cannot be merely defined who an older person is, who has single age limit. It is a social constructive based on custom practice and the perception of the role of the older person in the community. And then I would also like to stress that palliative care is an obligatory integral part of the realization of the right of everyone to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. So it is already enshrined in the human rights framework, but there is no specific article there. The COVID-19 crisis showed us that there is a necessity to meet the increasing demand for palliative care 
as a matter of priority and stress the importance of improving patient awareness, accessibility of service, and adequate training for healthcare professionals, which was already mentioned in some of the presentations. Moreover, there is a need to particularly focus on its efforts on ensuring that all actually receiving adequate levels of quality, quality palliative care on a non-discriminatory basis. Thank you all the panelists uh, for the vulnerable insights in your work. Besides COVID-19, I would like to mention that we already stressed the issue of palliative care on the broader basis in the ninth session of the open-ended working group on aging. We heard about good and bad examples and a lot of missing data on the issues, which was also already mentioned. In the 10th session, the participants of the open-ended working group had a small slot to discuss the normative elements of palliative care. In this regard, I would also like to mention and to bring to your attention that many things that became visible clearly through the pandemic were addressed during the discussion on the open-ended working group on aging. For those of you who have never heard about the open-ended working group on aging, it is a working group where we discuss how we could further and strengthen the human rights of older persons because older persons are very much overlooked in the discussions of human rights and there is no specific convention for older persons. As mentioned a couple of times, palliative care is part of the right to the highest attainable standard of health, but there does not exist an explicit article which deals with the issue of palliative care. There is none with a specific focus on the needs of older persons, as I already mentioned. We all know that in many countries, palliative care is still not existent or not even recognized at a me medical specialty, which shows that there is also a gap in this regard. But I would also like to show you another gap, which was already mentioned, and this is in the existing international framework, and it's also missing in many national frameworks, which was also highlighted by the SDG Secretary General a policy brief which was mentioned by Shayla in her first presentation and the Human Rights Commissioner in her speech on the 12th of, of May. Both made it quite clear from their perspective, which is a human rights based perspective, that action is urgent to improve the human rights framework in this regard. Because right now the international legal regime pertaining to the human rights of older persons is currently scattered uneven and incomplete, as we have heard already in these talks. Palliative care is not only about lifting older persons out of needless pain and distressing, it is an imperative to maintain their dignity. Governments around the world must ensure full access to palliative care of all terminally ill, including older persons and overcome all obstacles that restrict availability to essential palliative care medication. My role as an independent expert on the enjoyment for all human rights for older persons, I want to improve the situation and want to raise awareness on the needs to further the human rights of older persons. And we all together have to close the gaps in the normative framework. We had also learned in the crisis that older persons have been left alone in different settings. When it came to the need of palliative care during the pa pandemic, also in care homes, but also at home. And we also heard that the diversity of the risk is different around the world. So it might be good to think together how we can close the gap in the international legal framework to give guidance how to implement these human rights to the national level. We also heard that the caring staff and family members were left alone and did not get the support for safe working conditions. This is also part of the human right of the highest attainable standard of health and also the right to the labor. So we all have to ensure that we have learned something through this crisis, how to improve the situation and work together to get a better prepared word. Thank you so much. And I think I'll leave it with this because we need some time for questions and answers. 
thank you so much for inviting me and I'm really looking forward to collaborate with you much more in the future. Thank you very much, Claudio, and it's so good that you were able to join us and we hope, as you said, that we can collaborate uh, with you on an ongoing basis. I think something you said which is so important for the older person around the world is about dignity. And we've heard some very different situations um, in our presentations and how best can we provide palliative care for the older person within this COVID-19 pandemic. So over to Shelley um, and uh, Kate, I think it is, who are uh, doing looking at the questions and I can see there have been lots of questions in the chat box. So over to you, Kate. Thank you very much, Julia, and thank you um, for these very interesting presentations. Um, the first question um, is open to all panelists, and the um, delegate has asked, what do you see as the key psychological needs of older people in the times of COVID-19? <coughs> Julia, would you like me to start? Yeah, if you could start, that'd be great, Sheila. Okay. Um, well, thinking about old people who are not currently ill, but being isolated at home, um, and in many uh, countries, in European countries, being at home may mean that they are on their own. So I think the psychological needs are likely to be anxiety and uncertainty about what the future will hold. Um, loneliness um, by not being able to do the things that they would normally do and that may involve going to see their family members, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren or their friends um, uh, in, in all the social clubs and activities that they normally do. So, so that would be one thing. For people, who, older people who do have uh, an infection, then that mean uh, if they are very ill, um, going into hospital, and for a small proportion of those, if they become very, very ill, going into a critical care environment. Whether they're in hospital or in critical care, they will be in isolation, so no visitors. And we've already heard that older people may not have good digital skills so may not be able to use um, uh, phones and um, uh, other means of electronic virtual communication so i think there's a number of features there that suggest um, it won't be unique to an older person but they may be particularly problematic because they may not have some of the resources that younger people have Thanks, Sheila. And perhaps, Nizam, do you want to comment on that one as well from a different uh, setting? Can we, we, Stephen, can you unmute Nizam? Yeah. Uh... Very recently, there has been a survey done in Bangladesh that 75% of the total population is having insomnia due to fear and anxiety. And mostly, they are elderly people. I uh, understand this is an urban population, but there is only one. But I think that the best, the most important thing is proper, transparent information about the situation here that will be the most helpful which is very much lacking also thank you thank you Nizam. kate another question um the next question is um what are the differences between supporting an elderly person to develop an advanced care plan and an anticipatory care plan in palliative care. Um, are those two different things? And then there's a follow-on question, um, which is asking, what are your thoughts in regards to using the frailty score um, for critical care unit escalation and the decision-making process? Who would like to answer that one? Simon? Uh, well, um, 
this kind of uh, decision making process using a, a clinic, clinical frailty scale is something new that we introduce uh, uh, during this uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, we mm, try to um, evaluate uh, what uh, um, if is uh, uh, if is good or uh, if uh, it make problems. But I think. Uh, uh, we don't use only uh, clinical frailty scale, but we, we use, uh, uh, we combine other uh, instruments uh, internationally recognized to make a multidimensional evaluation of the patient. And also we don't uh, just uh, um, make an assessment and uh, uh, writing a paper, but we discuss with the team and with uh, the caregiver um, uh, the results of this uh, assessment. In this way, we can have more um, uh, more ideas uh, to um, to move. Uh, and to uh, write down uh, advanced care planning because uh, we have something objective um, and something to uh, exchange uh, also with colleagues and we say that okay this patient uh, uh, um, uh, this kind of cognitive impairment this kind of functional problem uh, this kind of uh, uh, multimorbidity and so on. And probably it's better that we can continue the care inside the nursing home because we have, we have nurses, doctor is not alone, and probably the risk to go to the hospital is higher than keep the patient in a uh, in nursing home or in home care when GP and nurses uh, from uh, rural uh, come to visit the, the patient. The important is don't uh, leave the patient alone and uh, uh, guarantee uh, the uh, access to uh, palliative care in every setting. But we know there isn't perfect instrument, but just uh, to combine multiple uh, instrument to create a kind of comprehensive and multidimensional approach would be better than using nothing and ignore the problem because we don't have time to do it to do that. Thank you. And uh, Sheila, perhaps you could answer. I think the other one was about was it anticipatory care plan and advanced care plan? Yes, thank you. So an uh, advanced care planning is um, an opportunity offered to people, uh, older persons or anybody, to express their wishes and preferences in relation to future care. This is usually discussed with their clinical team, but may be discussed with a volunteer in some places. Um, and uh, it allows them to think about their preferences of where they're cared for, whether they would like particular types of, of care, but also allows them to decline types of care that they would prefer not to have. And people can write that down in an advanced directive, or they can just have it as a conversation. And it's really important that you go back and, and check that people's wishes and preferences don't change over time. So it's not just one tick box and then it's finished. You need to check that people's wishes stay the same. Anticipatory care is usually done by um, physicians, nurses, and the wider multidisciplinary team where they think somebody may be approaching the end of life. And, and GPs would typically do this. And that allows them to start to have conversations with patients and their families. And it also starts to um, maybe put medication or particular equipment in people's homes, like what are called sometimes just in case boxes. So boxes of medicines and equipment that may be really useful for somebody 
if they have some very severe symptoms, particularly at a weekend or at a time that it's difficult for them um, to get that equipment. And it may enable people to be cared for at home if that's their choice. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Sheila. And I think I was, I know um, Dr. Moira Leng is on the call and I was just trying to check with her, but I think we, we, we were certainly discussing using a clinical frailty score um, within the protocols in Uganda for decision making um, for all, all doctors involved in COVID care. Okay, another question perhaps, Kate? Thank you, Julia. Um, this is just uh, asking for reflections from the panel on how we could elevate the role of carers in society. Um, the delegate said that generally, I mean, many countries, national health workers are paid poorly and as a job, it tends to be a job of necessity rather than a choice of career. Mm, who, who would like to? Yes, Claudia. <laughs> yes, I think this is one of the major, major problems also in the discussion here in Germany. I'm based here, so I can follow these discussions, but it's also true for many other countries that carers are paid not very well and that it is always or it's not acknowledged what they are doing and I think I would also like to raise another point we didn't mention during the discussion that many older persons are caring for another older relative for example or went back as staff and they had a very high risk and this is not really mentioned in the discussion as a positive impact on their part in the pandemic and I think how we can raise awareness to this is to show exactly that they are relevant professions and show that without them we could not go through this pandemic and never come back to our life before COVID-19 and we have to uh, yeah, work together as a solidarity in, in all the countries that we show the need that they are better paid and that's the so we can also get more people who join the forces as carers because we are we don't have enough of them in all our countries and we all know this and this is also because it's not acknowledged as this important job as it is and it's not paid well so therefore we really need to raise awareness to this and i think it's right it's the perfect time to do this once again thank you Thank you. Nizam, what about uh, yourself and carers in Bangladesh? Actually, is, is... Actually I'm not sure if Nizam is still here. So, uh, uh -uh. oh yes he is, great. <laughs> yeah, uh, you were saying about the low paid care provider, right? Yeah, and, and raising the profile of carers because of all that carers do. Yeah, uh, in, in actually now in, in our country, if, we, if I'm talking broadly, the carers are usually the family members because that's the place where the people at the end of life or palliative care need are practically there at home. But for particularly very small few patients who get the institutional support, uh, then we have a system of palliative care assistant who are, uh, who are not really professional nurses, but caregivers, paid caregivers, uh, not very well paid, but paid caregivers also for, for home service. But ma for majority of people, the care is being provided by uh, family family members who are not trained, who have everything for the patient. I mean, like all the love and compassion, but without any training. So you understand what is the situation on the ground really. So when you talk about caregivers poorly paid, I often wonder that how to respond because in our part, most of the people, the care is being given by the family members without any, any the knowledge and the skill of hand. Yeah, and, and that's so important as well because how do we recognize the immense role that family members have in yeah, caring? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that has often has financial implications for them as they're having to do the caring and are not able to work. Yeah. So 
many issues there. Many, many, many issues actually influencing the whole system. Oh. Yeah, Sheila, you want to comment? I just want to say that in, ver in all countries around the world, family caregivers are the major providers of care provision. So I think that would be absolutely common um, in most places. So, uh, and they need the financial resources. They also need the emotional support to continue to give care and, and the education so that they, in the process of delivering care, do not themselves become injured or ill. Uh, and uh, so I think there's a whole raft of things that we need to think about and acknowledge for family caregivers, um, uh, as well as people who are um, care assistants, they call them slightly different names in different countries, but um, not qualified care providers, but who are paid, also need opportunities to have education so that they can deliver their care in ways that are safe for them but also maximally benefit the people that they provide care for. And that's predominantly older people. Yeah, and you know, f family caregivers are so important. Obviously they have different, um, different support networks and different pr uh, provision of PPE and various different things in different parts of the country. But uh, without the family caregivers, we would really be struggling in terms of caring for older persons. Um, Kate, I think we've got time for another question. Thank you, Julia. Um, as Dr. Simone mentioned, there is a misconception that palliative care, especially for older people, is just for the end of life. Do you think that the COVID-19 pandemic has helped with not thinking about palliative care in older persons just at the end of life, or do you think it has made the situation worse? I hope that uh, these uh, um, uh, humanitarian crisis uh, uh, help uh, uh, for other non-palliative care uh, doctors to think about this topic because uh, they have to manage this situation and maybe now they understand that they need tools, uh, support, colleagues that can help to make the decision I'm not sure what will be happen, but I think that could be um, a challenge for future because uh, after a crisis, uh, we have to take uh, something good to, um, to, to make progress in our society. And this is one of the, the possibilities uh, if, uh, if, if everybody like us work together in, the, in, uh, in this direction, modify educational program, program um, and discuss uh, of the topic, uh, not only in healthcare system, but outside uh, like newspaper or community level, maybe we can make uh, uh, the, this change become a reality. But this is my wishes. I don't, I don't know what will happen after that. Thank you. And anybody else want to comment on that? Nazim, was that, was, were you putting your hand up there? Not sure. Okay, perhaps Kate, we've got yeah one quick question. If the, if there's such a thing as a quick question. Thank you. Um, we've just got uh, <laughs> two questions about um, caregiving in isolation. Um, the first one is how um, can we do um, a home visit during the pandemic? Um, so the questions directed both at um, Prof Sheila and Prof Nezam. Um, how do we fulfill um, or maintain the health and social needs of the elderly in the midst of physical distancing? And the related question, um, 
is how can we respect the wishes um, of people who have COVID-19 and want to die at home? Um, what recommendations could you give caregivers that have a high potential of infection? Okay, so Sheila, do you want to go first and then Nizam will come to you? Um. Well, I think it's a challenge in countries with uh, palliative care services to adapt those services and use them flexibly. So instead of providing the care within hospices, it may be that they need to think more about having community teams. Now, the community teams, of course, need to have access to appropriate PPE, so personal protective equipment that, uh, that keeps them safe. Um, but I think that flexible working uh, is a, a challenge that some palliative care services have done extremely well, and we can perhaps learn from them in the future. Okay, Nizam, a few final thoughts from you? <laughs> yeah, uh, I would like to mention two things. Number one, that even in the national guideline for COVID-19 or nowhere in the last two, two months, a palliative care has ever been mentioned for the management of COVID patients, number one. Number two, uh, I don't think even in this, I do, we as a palliative care team here, we don't have any experience in providing support to the home of the palliative care, home of the COVID infected patients. Uh, we have heard about those things like if, if the, the telemedicines and other things, uh, but Practically, I don't have any experience. My team up to now doesn't have any experience, but we know that Kerala, they have some experience. They have actually brought out a guideline also for this, for the home care patients. Uh, so my experience is only very theoretical without any first practical experience. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think we've got access to those guidelines from COLA on the website and we'll make sure that we do have that. So I think we've uh, run out of time. Um, I'm just going to hand over to uh, Dr. Stephen Connor from WHPCA to tell us about next week's webinar. Thank you, Julian. So next week we're going to have a very special presentation that will be um, titled How Patients with Pre-Existing Palliative Care Needs Are Impacted During the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so this will be a panel of uh, individuals who've had experience with receiving palliative care, um, moderated by Dr. Helena Davies, one of our trustees at WHPCA in the UK, uh, including Lucy Watts, who is a young person uh, receiving palliative care and an advocate for palliative care, Parmala Gupta, who runs the CAN support program in India, and Sarah Gibson from Ireland. So uh, Thursday of next week at the same time, uh, please uh, join us for that special presentation. We'll back to you, Julia. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for joining us today. As you know, we have more webinars planned over the coming uh, weeks. So please do join us um, every Thursday. Um, but please do join me in thanking today's uh, faculty members, uh, Sheila, Nizam, Simone, Stephen and Claudia. Uh, for an excellent session and for all of your input and we really appreciate your time um, for this session and for the um, for all you have shared with us so thank you each one of you and then on behalf of the global palliative care organizations I'd like to thank you all for being part of our discussions today for all that you are doing within palliative care and in particular during this time of the COVID-19 pandemic so please stay well and keep safe thank you all very much